Hello. I am William Calvin, a professor emeritus at the University of Washington's Medical School in Seattle. Those familiar with my 16 books may have noticed climate creeping in, starting about 1990, as I struggled to understand what allowed our brain to triple in size in only the last 2 million years. Usually, climate change is what allows evolutionary processes to speed up, so I have had a ringside seat for all of the major developments in climate science of the past 40 years. Since my voice has become unreliable as our pollen count creeps up, I am experimenting with using a voiceover, one with better enunciation than mine, to speak my words on this occasion. We've always had extreme weather in small amounts. Now we seem to have an additional driver, rising to prominence. The hairpin turns of the jet stream are part of the setup for the new windstorms, big floods, fire weather, stalled hurricanes, droughts, arctic outbreaks, and mega heat waves. The big five surged when global warming had paused from 2002 through 2012. All five were sustained, as well. They did not go away when warming resumed in 2013. During the hiatus, the carbon dioxide excess kept steadily rising. Next. That tells us something. It tells us that big trouble from extreme weather does not depend on the next little rise in global mean surface temperature, which has been averaged over day and night. Over all four seasons. Lumping together summer northern hemisphere data with winter data from the southern, and often doing a running average on a few adjacent years before plotting a number. That's another good reason to talk of climate crisis, rather than global warming. It seems that our measure of global warming is just an index like the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Perhaps a better analogy for global warming is the way accountants use cash flow, as an index of which way things are progressing over time. Next, I prefer to emphasize the jet stream pathologies and how to head them off, rather than the more common focus on staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Here is that Arctic outbreak in February 2021, which even affected Texas. Texas had not prepared, even after a similar freeze 10 years earlier caused similar power failures, counting on the rest of the country to bail them out when another one struck. As we did, Texas even went so far as to make its power grid independent of the rest of the country, in order to escape federal regulation and save money. The polar jet stream is shown in red. It had seven southerly dips out of its circular path. The wide one over North America did a lot of damage. After the dip over the Pacific Ocean, the jet stream turned north and rose back up to the Gulf of Alaska, then headed down the west coast, until turning east at the tip of Baja California. It followed the Gulf Coast east, and then turned northeast, up the Atlantic coast, all of the way up to Labrador. Below the jet's path is a rising curtain of air caused by the warm and humid tropical air, when it bumps into the cooler and drier Arctic air mass, what generates much of our frontal system weather. An Arctic outbreak occurs when the jet stream dips much farther south than usual. Air rises, when the tropical air mass collides with the polar one. Part of this ribbon-like air curtain turns right, forming an eastbound river at cruising altitude 30 to 40,000 feet, because of the Coriolis effect. That rising air curtain, in turning east, adds to the jet stream. It flows at 100 miles per hour. Next, perhaps this 1955 Marilyn Monroe photo will help remind you of the air curtain concept. She is standing on a New York City sidewalk grading that vents tunnel air, being compressed by an arriving subway train. The air curtain at a department store's front door always directs the air downward instead. Next. When the jet stream path is not being buckled into loops, it looks, if not circular, then segmented, something like this Scientific American illustration for Michael Mann's March 2019 jet stream article. Since passenger jets can pick up a tailwind of 100 miles per hour when flying from Seattle to East Coast cities, we sometimes landed an hour early. Pilots heading back to Seattle often took a path up over Canada, to avoid the headwind. The polar jet stream's ground path, those segments, drift eastward, 
which is what causes our weather to move on. If they do not drift eastward, which can happen when those southerly loops develop, strange things can happen. For example, the North Pole might melt, even in the 24-hour darkness of the Arctic winter. Next, note that top jet stream loop, that allows tropical air to reach northern Greenland. On another occasion, the loop reached past the North Pole. Had there been a real pole there, any ice adhering to it would have melted. This particular blocking high is what caused the left turn of Hurricane Sandy in 2012, that red line, which took it ashore in New Jersey. Next, the storm surge went up the Hudson River through New York City, flooding Wall Street and subway stations. Next, jet stream buckling may be a common cause of extreme weather. When one of those tongues of southern air, a high-pressure system, fails to move on to the east, the jet stream path behind it tends to buckle, forcing its turnaround even farther south to form a narrow hairpin turn. There will be a lot of air turbulence near that 180 degree turn. Next, might there be a common cause of our surges? We have five types of extreme weather that surged more than 200% in recurrence rate or severity in the first decade of the 21st century. 2002, the first stalled hurricane in Mexico. 2003, the first mega heat wave, in Europe, 2006, fire weather surge in the US, 2008, the surge of severe inland windstorms in the US, and 2010, the surge of severe inland floods in the US. Next, let me remind you of that slide from last time, used to show that the big five surges all began during that 10-year warming hiatus, from 2002 through 2012. Now, let us look at how those southerly loops create a setup for the big five types. High over the eastern U.S. in March 2014, the eastward drifting jet stream path buckled. Such 500 km wide hairpin loops only last for a few days, the 1,500 km wide planetary waves we saw before can stay stalled for a month. Here we see a blocking high parked over the eastern U.S. To the west of the block, the jet stream's path buckles, creating many more opportunities for extreme weather. The jet stream path turns south over Seattle, dropping down from Canada to Mexico, and then turning north, heading back up to Canada. Star 1. A stay-in-place low, say, the middle of the dip, can create severe floods. Star 2. A stay-in-place blocking high in summer may create a heat wave. Star 3. Both mega heat waves were preceded by low rainfall in the spring. Thus, evaporative cooling from soil moisture halted in midsummer when the moisture was depleted. It had been helping to keep near surface temperatures a few degrees cooler. Star 4. That eastern high can stall a hurricane. In 2017 Harvey, that created severe rain and winds for five days, not just five hours. Star 5 and especially near a 180-degree turn in its turbulence, severe windstorms can occur inland. They did not all happen on March 20, 2014, I am just using the picture to illustrate where the vulnerabilities occur. In asking what the Big Five surges have in common, note that all involve an increased duration of some type. Stalled eastward drift of jet stream loops, by a blocking high, seems part of an explanation for the sudden worsening. Next, note that, once southerly dips form, and a standing wave locks them in place, we see a round-the-world pattern of lows and highs, enduring day after day. Simultaneous hits can indeed occur. And have. Here is the jet stream on July 22, 2018. Japan, up top, had a heat wave. Across the Pacific Ocean, Seattle was getting orange smoke from those 2018 wildfires in California. There was also a heat wave going on in the American Southwest. The U.S. East Coast had heavy flooding. There was drought across Central Europe, and wildfires in Greece. And Scandinavia had a bad heat wave. Oslo and Stockholm are both 60 degrees from the equator, the same as Anchorage, Alaska. Most of Scandinavia is further north, so that is a heat wave at Alaskan latitudes. 
Next. So, for extreme weather from jet stream loops, there is a danger of an economic crash from multiple places taking hits simultaneously, as on July 22, 2018. There is a limit on how many fires can be fought at once. It is set in advance by preparation. How many firefighters do you train? How many fire engines do you invest in? For pandemics, how many respirators? How many spare hospital beds? Germany invested in a lot more than the US. Hospitals in the US were so intent on keeping their beds full, making the hospital more profitable, that they did not have much room for a surge in April 2020. Sequential hits. The one-two punch. As when a mega heat wave follows a spring drought. Back-to-back -back episodes can threaten a regional population crash via famine, epidemics, resource wars, and genocides. About 80 to 90 percent of a regional human population can die that way within a few years. Such a crash regularly happens to Pacific sea bird populations during a single El Nino. Next, here is the 2019 appraisal of climate scientist Michael Mann. During the extreme events I noted, the jet stream acted strangely. The bends went exceptionally far north and south, and they stalled, they did not progress eastward. The larger these bends, the more punishing the weather gets near the northern peak and southern trough. And when they stall, as they did over the US in the summer of 2018, those regions can receive heavy rain, day after day, or get baked by the sun, day after day. Record floods, droughts, heat waves and wildfires occur. My collaborators and I have recently shown that these highly curved, stalled wave patterns have become more common because of global warming, boosting extreme weather. Next. What does it say about the instability of the global economy, if so many places could take an even bigger hit on the same day? Mutual aid agreements might not work very well. Currently in the US, when the West Coast has an earthquake disaster, the rest of the US helps to bail us out. The same for the East Coast hurricane disasters. Both coasts bail out the middle of the country when they have big floods and droughts. What happens to this insurance scheme, when too many disasters happen at once? Or, for that matter, when deep political divisions develop between regions of the US and they become slow to deliver aid, as in 2005's Hurricane Katrina, which flooded New Orleans? Next. To conclude part 1, here are some lessons learned. Overheating began in 1976. After 1984, land warmed three times more quickly than did the sea surface temperature. From 1950 to 1984, they had tracked each other. The hiatus in warming between 2002 to 2012 was when the big five surges in billion-dollar extreme weather began. Deep loops in the polar jet stream seem approximate cause of the five extreme weather types that surged. Simultaneous hits and sequential hits are especially dangerous as they could collapse the global economy and its food distribution, promoting a human population crash. Just to remind you where we are in this four-part climate series. So, a brief diversion into what psychologists call mindset. Our mindset for climate action is about a half century old. It features a cause-effect response framework that goes something like this. The combustion of fossil fuels causes overheating of the Earth's surface. Therefore, we must reduce our annual emissions. Seems logical. Indeed, it worked in the 1970s for smog, cleaning up much of urban air pollution by reducing tailpipe emissions. But, as we shall see, lessons from visible air pollution do not carry over very well to invisible trace gases such as carbon dioxide and methane. They are not cleaned up by the next good rain, in the manner of visible air pollution. They keep accumulating. But new data, like those mega heat waves, have been forced into this old three-step framework. After all, the story goes, their root cause is the same, excess carbon dioxide in the air created by our emissions. 
As we teach in medical school, it is nice to know the root cause, but it is not likely to be the most immediate thing to address when the patient finally seeks treatment. First, the physician must deal with any threatening consequences. Next, gradual overheating, secondary to excess carbon dioxide from emissions, is no longer the correct focus for understanding the risk we now face. Back-to-back -back episodes of extreme weather threaten regional population crashes via famine, pandemics, resource wars, and genocides. The lead time for doing something effective to head that off, that is what makes climate an emergency now. Think about that for a moment, next. So, in shopping around for better mindsets for climate action, perhaps we should first take a look at the one developed over the last 2,500 years since Hippocrates. I'm sure that army generals have their own well-trained mindset, emergency management specialists another, but physicians are probably the largest group of practitioners, and they have the most varied problem types, to inspect for closing windows of opportunity. Particularly in emergency medicine, the initial focus is not on the root cause of the patient's problem. It is about the knock-on problems, immediate life threats, such as internal bleeding and shock. Next. One must survive the short run, in order to make the long run relevant. That focus in emergency medicine is what the climate crisis now requires. Which parts of the physician's mental checklist would a climate doctor want to consider adapting? Next. Here is my list, supplemented with some opinions about how well they work for climate and pandemics. A. Beforehand, sensible anticipations for winds and heat waves, burying power lines and creating battery backup for air conditioning, rebuilding infrastructure to resist floods, and relocating people out of flood plains and coastlines, stockpiling, but also economic modeling for emergencies, planning we should have done before the pandemic's 2020 recession. For climate's extreme weather, not noticeable. B. Protect the patient from the usual causes of terminal downhill slides. This is commonly called stabilizing the patient. The public works construction in the 1930s likely prevented civil disorder in the Great Depression, of the sort seen in January 2021 at the U.S. Capitol Building. For both pandemics and climate, not done. C. Recognize what's wrong. For climate, the working diagnosis since 1980 is an uneven but global-scale overheating, caused by the atmospheric accumulation of carbon dioxide, contributed by the annual emissions of fossil fuels. Success, but attacking the root cause via emissions reduction is now too slow. D. To evaluate urgency and motivate action, try estimating where things might be headed. We call that the prognosis. Climate models are good for estimating slow climate change over a century, but they are only beginning to address the dynamic aspects that can create climate flips within a decade. Partial success. E. Rule out other problems. Repeatedly search for knock on climate problems, analogous to shock and internal bleeding, that could provoke a fast track to disaster. For climate, only beginning. F. Formulate a plan of action and explain it to get consent. For climate, inadequate. Like most diets, emissions reduction has failed. The annual bump up in carbon dioxide from emissions is now 50% greater than before 2000. We must now focus on a quick cleanup of the existing carbon dioxide accumulation, analogous to using a kidney dialysis machine to quickly clean up an aspirin overdose from the circulating blood. G. Finally, try to prevent a recurrence, as in persuading a patient with asthma to stop smoking. But note that addressing the longer term is, on the doctor's mental checklist, the last thing to do. Most of the list was concerned with keeping the patient alive, to make the long run relevant. Partial success. We have had 50 years of climate education efforts but something is preventing effective climate action even by the knowledgeable. Perhaps it is the stay-in-your-seat spectator mindset for the surreal. 
that's where gunshots on stage don't cause you to drop to the floor and phone 911. Next. I hope to see a future when climate doctors have a similar checklist, frequently revisited, to the one taught in medical schools. A. Are sensible precautions in motion? Explain. B. Are we stabilizing the patient, to prevent sudden deterioration? C. What's the working diagnosis? D. Have we estimated the prognosis? How urgent? I see you. E. When is the last time we ruled out other problems? F. What's the plan of action? Have you explained it sufficiently? G. Long-term precautions for prevention of another case. When those responsible for climate action seem comfortable with answering such questions from reporters, I will breathe easier. To conclude part 2, here are some lessons learned. The urgency of climate action depends on both the speed of advance of climate disruptions, and on how much lead time is needed for effective climate actions. That timing is why we have an emergency now. Gradual overheating, secondary to excess carbon dioxide from emissions, is no longer the correct focus for understanding the risk we now face. Episodes of extreme weather threaten regional population crashes via famine, epidemics, resource wars, and genocides. Next, our mindset for climate action is out of date. To repeat, it leads to the stay-in-your-seat spectator mindset for the surreal. Mindset is very important for public buy-in for action. But my message here is aimed at the leadership, who already know enough of the story, but who have not been able to get their act together to aim at climate restoration not just slowing down our runaway train a little. There are well-studied mindsets that could be adapted for the climate leadership, such as the physician's mental checklist for closing windows of opportunity. Next, the next few slides are an optional supplement about tipping points in the earth systems, those downhill slides which are so difficult to stop, once started. They are sufficiently sobering that I consider them adult content, though not for the usual reasons. Yet I do want to give an example of digging deeper into mechanisms. So here goes. In 1985, a few years after I started to closely follow climate science, the late oceanographer Wally Broker started positing a long, long ocean current looping around our planet. In blue, it loops between the North Atlantic Ocean, where it sinks in whirlpools, to the Indian Ocean and the North Pacific, where it resurfaces. Then, for the return trip in orange, it stays nearer the surface, picking up heat when passing through the tropics. That warms the air above the ocean, which the westerly winds blow into Europe. That ribbon in the North Atlantic is oversimplified. The following slides will show the path. Here is that wonderful animated graphic from the New York Times, showing the ocean surface currents. The Florida Peninsula is about 150 miles wide, similar to the diameter of the detached eddies that look like donuts. Around an eddy's periphery, 10-mile diameter whirlpools may form, not seen here, spinning in the opposite direction, at least in the Labrador and Greenland seas, they efficiently skim off the surface water and sink it into the middle depths in a day's time. That's overturning at its most efficient. Here are those two major sinking sites for the dense surface water, cooled by evaporation into those cold winds off Canada, and laden with extra salts left behind by evaporation. Eventually the surface water is too dense to keep floating, so down it goes. Sometimes a spiral forms, and that can move surface water more quickly into the deep ocean. As it happens, number 1, the Greenland Sea Overturning Site, failed back in 1978. It recovered over the following decade. About 10 years after its recovery, the second largest overturning site, in the Labrador Sea, failed in 1997. Flushing resumed after 10 years. Thus, in the last 40 years, both northerly sinking sites have failed, each for about 10 years. Were both major sites to fail at the same time, there would be a climate leap within several years as sea surface temperature cooled and the winds rearranged. In past episodes, 
that suddenly cooled the entire northern hemisphere and reduced rainfall. Yet simultaneous failure is not what is usually meant in those headlines about a collapse of the AMOC, standing for the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Current, the Gulf Stream is a segment of its path. Rather, they are talking about the AMOC gradually slowing down over a century's time, as measured between Bermuda and Florida when the return current is deep and southbound. A quarter century ago, Stefan Romsdorf's simulations of the overturning predicted this decline and I got a week's tutoring from him about the subject in 1998, after my cover story in The Atlantic. The measured AMOC confirms the model's prediction about a decline. But like the models predicting gradual overheating over the rest of this century, the AMOC models are not yet detailed enough to handle when climate might instead flip, on the timescale of the two observed failures. The news stories rarely mention the shutdown history of the two major overturning sites, and the more immediate threat of a simultaneous failure at both sites. Just because we cannot put numbers to it doesn't decrease the threat. An observation climate scientists really do not like to talk in public about the parts of the climate problem that they have not mastered yet. Most basic scientists are happy to speculate and caution. But climate scientists have been attacked for 30 years by the fossil fuel lobbyists as alarmists and so they have a different mindset by now. There is one worrisome development in the last decade. It concerns the cold blob in the ocean south of Greenland. It is about the only place on our planet that is cooling while the rest is warming. The conveyor belt splits west of Ireland into the Norwegian Current, continuing north to overturn in the Greenland Sea, and a westbound branch heading to the second overturning site in the Labrador Sea, between southwest Greenland and Canada. If the westbound branch were starting to fail, it would no longer supply heat to the surface ocean en route, leading to a cold blob. So, stay tuned for updates. Those overturning failures are likely to involve weaker winds from Canada, so the surface waters never become dense enough to efficiently sink. But, just as in a medical diagnosis, one first has to eliminate other possibilities for the cooler blob, that's the state of the science for now. Change is not necessarily gradual, and there are at least 16 tipping points promising rapid deterioration of life on Earth. The tipping point failure of the big sinking sites would cause the overturning to occur more slowly and at lower latitudes, and so Europe would not get its pre-warmed air in winter. This has happened many times, the younger Dryas being the most recent of dozens. I have written about losing the Amazon in my climate books. But here I must be brief. There are at least another 15 tipping point candidates, thought to be similarly dramatic in their sudden effects on our food supply. A recent review by the Potsdam climate scientists sorted them into three broad categories. Here are the six that involve ice. And another six that involve changes in the winds and ocean currents. Plus four candidates for ecosystem catastrophes. The globe shows where some of them are located. If we are going to save our civilization from a population crash, we are going to need to stabilize Earth systems. Most of those tipping points would lose us our institutions. After two generations without schools during the great downsizing, our civilization would be largely forgotten in the scramble to survive. We might still have agriculture but, with the population crash, social organization would likely resemble what came after the egalitarian hunter-gatherers settled down about 10,000 years ago. Egalitarian was lost. Bullies, only interested in control, invented extortion, without any redistribution of wealth or public works as a benefit. It took another 4,000 years until the need for large-scale irrigation reshaped government. It was another 3,500 years to Socrates and Plato, then 2,500 more years to widespread literacy and internet smartphones. The recovery from the population crash might take the same 10,000 years. Maybe less, as our current technologies were recovered. 
but maybe it would take even longer. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. And our fall would involve a lot of wars and genocides. Survivors would pass hatred down the generations, slowing cooperation efforts and the recovery. There are a great many reasons to work hard now to stabilize all of those threatened Earth systems. Next time, I show why emissions reduction is too little, too late. But most types of decarbonization are still worth doing for standard environmental and economic reasons. Too many of the decarbonization schemes have claimed to be climate solutions, when they would only slightly affect the present course of climate change. It is time to get realistic. Thank you for your attention. Any questions?